Barbara is the author of the poetry collections, Bite Every Sorrow, the winner of the Walt Whitman Award and the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, One Hidden Stuff, The Last Skin. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, among others. Her poems have appeared in the New Yorker, Tin House, Granta, and Orion, as well as in other magazines and anthologies. She has taught in the MFA program for, for writers at Warren Wilson College, and it workshops nationally and internationally. She lives in San Antonio and is the founding director of Trinity University Press. She's gonna be reading from her brand new collection. And um, Sophia is gonna put all of the information about the books in the chat. Please everyone help me welcome Barbara Raz. Thank you, Jennifer. I am so delighted to be here and um, thrilled to be reading with such a stellar group of poets. I'm going to start with a poem that is a little bit of an autobiog autobiographical poem, and it takes place in my hometown of New Bedford, Massachusetts, where I grew up in a very economically depressed and culturally deprived situation and ended up finding myself back there on one of those bounces that happens when you're 27 and you have nowhere to go. So as Robert Frost famously said, home is where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And I found myself kind of getting into the heart of what was part of New Bedford as a fishing village. And it was an interesting experience to find myself in a completely unfamiliar place. And that's partly what this poem is about. It's called Soul and it's S-O-L-E like the fish. Soul, I remember writing a bird flying fast into snow, being back in the States, thinking of a lost love and typing as usual on the Smith Corona manual passed on to me by my father. And while I was trying to find myself in the hometown, I had already crossed two continents to escape. I waitressed at Louis on the wharf across from Aiello's fish house. And on breaks, the fish workers would cram the restaurant for coffee and pie. And I'd make my way through their black rubber boots and aprons, all sequined with fish scales their smell and shining, wretched and resplendent, while Louie stared out the window as if to ask the air for some truth. And I wished I could have been <clears throat> at a matinee of Children of Paradise showing against all odds in a theater here, while dozens of customers yelled their orders, most for regular coffee, as we called it, so before pouring coffee, I had to pump cream into the cup. No pitchers on the tables, no tiny plastic tubs of whitening destined for a future, this future, where Manny Aiello will never appear again to give me a five pound box of sole, slices of fish as fresh as petals dipped in salt water. This book, <clears throat> this book addresses um, a number of different kinds of grief, including um, grief for our planet, as well as um, some of the other horrors that we have been witnessing over the last several years. And one of the things that is has been truly affecting me and comes up throughout this book is the climate crisis. And I think a lot of us have been seeing 
that intensifying. And this was written some years ago, but I think it kind of gets to the point. It begins with a, it begins in, with a little whimsy, but as you'll see, it quickly gets to a different place. The day a crucial button fell off my blouse into the toilet was the day Trudy, my nine pound terrier mutt, put her paw on my bare foot like a scrap of crushed velvet. And though I wanted to send thoughts of gratitude into her little dog brain, all I could do was envy her for not having to wear clothes or get her mental panties in a wad trying to figure out what the Nepali poet meant by Westerners love Rilke because he approaches the preliterate. It was the day I learned that Dell has a detector under their computer keyboards to record fist bangs and thus dodge warranties. Imagine pummeling a machine as if it could fix the brokenness of parents whose dismays about their own choices could be passed down to their kids through the knives set at the table. It was the day I learned the CIA plans to geoengineer the stratosphere by, by spraying cola ash to offset global warming. And this, on a day I learned residents in Karachi are digging mass graves to prepare for another heat wave like last year's that killed 1,300 people. Increasingly, days like this end with who the hell will pickaxe a trench for me in 127 degrees. And unfortunately, this poem is a little bit dated because 127 degree temperatures are not unheard of in these times. The next poem that I'll read is a poem that starts out in a little bit of a fantasy about using a cloak that I would, in my poetry fantasy, try on to create a little bit of um, a talisman against the future. And then it goes into some actual experiences that I had while traveling. Now, I've had the great good fortune to be on many trips of cultural diplomacy around the world, traveling with the International Writers Program and, and others. And so a lot of foreign um, vignettes and images appear in my poems. Some of them maybe take just a little tiny particle from an experience and sometimes others will be a little bit more expansive and this poem sort of does both so it's called my cloak of not knowing when i worry about the future i put it on woven for all i know from the fur of a cat the color of a honey pony who would follow me stride for stride if i climbed the fence into his pasture to wander, wonder about springtime in Mongolia without knowing who combs the winter out of the hair of the small horses there and whether they celebrate the first flowers with the feast of mare's milk, which may begin at sunset and end at sunrise, the yurts billowing with snores. But I know nothing of that sleep. Having been rained out of a yurt built for our visit, when the wet drove us from the village to a near city, bumping over rutted roads disrupted by boulders, whose long slide began from I don't know how high up the steep hillsides, and at each place they landed, Tupchuvik left the car to roll slimy stones to the side of the road, and we joined him pushing together against the weight that might outweigh a monster ram butt. But although I don't know who pushed harder than who, we muddied our hands together in silence. And days later, at the end of the trip, I don't know if he saw me weeping at the airport, not having the words to tell him 
that his hours and hours at the wheel had given shape to the kindness of his country. Nor could I have known that in the future of my journey, I would pay an astrologer to tell me, sorrow is like a faint sky and you will learn more loving both. I knew I could spend a lifetime not knowing how sorrow had become my second skin and that no matter how far I traveled, the sky would be the same, though disguised by different weathers. So this last poem is a poem, well, actually, I'm going to read this one in between because it's not too long. And it's really sort of a um, completely imaginative poem that doesn't have any bearing in terms of experience or um, drawing on, on real life. It's called Flags. For some reason, we chose an island off Italy to bring a typewriter for repair. And meanwhile, Chianti, and lounging on the balcony, pondering if Kafka had in fact invented the hard hat, and who came up with the idea of hotel maids folding toilet paper into triangles, pointless points. Imagine the cumulative moments the worldwide spent thus, instead of indulging in a decent foot soak, thinking perhaps about a grandmother in the village her mother's mother, who greets her by taking both her hands and rubbing them long enough to wring out hundreds of secrets. Never forget the names of our breads, she will say, and together they'll sit, staring at the horizon. One thing we have in common, seeing as we too are looking out at it now, the horizon holding up the entire sky all day pulling down the sun that golden child reluctant to go to bed and when there is wind sending rolls of whipped cream to our shores but forget flags the horizon refuses flags none of that vain flappery whether the saltier of scotland the eagles of albania the wounded sheet of latvia Flags flown in theaters, colonies, operations. Flags carried in the children's crusade. Rags, no doubt. Flags for genocide after genocide after genocide. We find it humanly possible to abide. So as I said, there are many different kinds of grief running through this book and one of the um one of the recurring griefs was the loss of my brother who was my only sibling and he died in a, a very um sudden and i guess you would say dire um fight with cancer that really took him way too early and this poem is called salad days and some of you will associate salad days with the idea of youthful exuberance and innocence. And the first time it was used, it was it appeared in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, which is why Shakespeare appears mentioned in the poem. And Cleopatra ruefully remembers her somewhat misspent early days. And so the title, kind of goes both ways in terms of an echo of sorrow and also this sort of spirit of innocence and freedom. Salad days. How easy then, the fun house at Lincoln Park, before it grew into a field of weeds, you could buy five tickets for a buck from a blank face in a booth and enter the dark with your brother to be scared by tilting floors, phony doors, corpses bursting out of coffins, and once out into blue sky, run breathless to your mother and father, happy. You could have called them salad days, but why would you? No one in your family had read Shakespeare, 
So you bought French fries, doused them with malt vinegar, the four of you competing for your share of potatoes improved by salt and grease and nothing in those early evenings free of care could have prepared you to be the last one left, the one with grief to spare. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was so beautiful. Thank and you. Um, that poem that you just read, that was published in, in Granta, but I'm not sure if there's a paywall, um, but people can can look that up and see if you can read that last poem. And also Sophia um, has put in the chat information about ordering your most recent book from- you Well, know, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you again for hosting me. And thank, thank you to everyone in the audience who came out for the reading. It was wonderful to hear your work. Thanks, Jennifer. And um, now we're going to hear from Heidi Seaborn. Her first full length, her full length collection, An Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe, won the 2020 Pank Books Poetry Prize and was published in June 2021. Her first full length poetry collection, Give a Girl Chaos, See What She Can Do, was published in March 2019 by CNR Press. Her work has appeared in over 100 journals, including American Poetry Journal, Beloit Poetry Review, Copper Nickel, Missouri Review, Greensboro Review, Nimrod, Penn Review, Mississippi Review, and many others, including The Slowdown with Tracy K. Smith. She's also been published um, in um, a, pan, a political pamphlet called Body Politic by Mount Analog Press in 2017. And she has published three chapbooks, including Finding My Way Home and Bite Marks, winner of the 2020 Comstock Review Chapbook Prize. And, fourth, and the forthcoming Once a Diva from Dancing Girl Press in 2021. She received her MFA at NYU and serves as the executive editor of the Adroit Journal, and she is also on the board of Tupelo Press. Please help me welcome Heidi Seaborn. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And it is really an honor to read with Barbara and Jennifer Jean tonight. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out because it, it is summer. It's the dog days of summer, and yet we are here to celebrate poetry. Um, I am going to read from An Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe, and there she is on the cover. And um, this is a book that is really a what I describe as a middle of the night conversation between Marilyn Monroe and the speaker, who is some version of the poet. And it takes place, they're both insomniacs, and, um, and they have a lot to talk about. So I'll start with, um, the, and the, the voices toggle back and forth, so, um, and get a little blurry as things get in the middle of the night. Hmm. Marilyn in the tea leaves, you were never my thing, so past tense. You were dead even then and unknowable, a relic really, your pink leather makeup case, hips swinging, inflating the air. What do you have to say for yourself? This poem is what we have to say for ourselves. And it starts with an epigraph from um, JAMA Internal Medicine Study, September, 2019. And the quote is, one in 16 American women's first sexual intercourse experience is rape. Oh, darling, before I was blonde as sunshine, I was a strange girl in a home of strangers schooled by a man who called himself daddy. I baked him a whole pie. He sliced it into fractions, the fruit softening before the knife. 
juice of furred berries blackening the tin, I remember the next morning. When I opened the curtains, the green garden dulled as if someone hadn't dusted. Brambles thickened the chain link fence, berries fallen and rotting. I buried the memory like a bone. Marilyn, I remember clumps of dandelions as if colored by a child, above smudged sky blue and baby powder clouds, blue jean cutoffs. His skin was lumber. I could pick him out of a Crayola box, even now, decades later, when sometimes I forget what happened yesterday. Oh, breasts. Oh, fat and dumb and white. Oh, precious tickets to a carnival, cotton candy, Disneyland Matterhorn, roller coaster, oh, show stealers, main stage act. I'm your backup singer. Oh, tricksters, how dare you pretend to guard a heart. And this next poem is called Hey. And it's an abecedarian, and it's um, a bunch of words, the words that sometimes women get called. And I'm just going to read them. Does it sound good, everyone? Yeah? OK. Hey, apple, ass, anchor, bitch, blonde, bombshell, beauty, bay, baby, blossom, bug, bird, bubblehead, child, chick, cream puff, cherry, cookie, cock tease, cunt. Darling, dear, dog, daddy's girl, dirty girl, demon, divorcee, dangerous, drug, evil, exotic, everything. Fix, fling, flower, femme fatale, floozy, fox, fondle, fuck, girl, goddess, gift, gal, heart, heartache, headache, haughty, honey, honeybee, heaven, hard on, hellcat, ice queen, jewel, juice, joy, joke, jam, Kitty cat, cat, kiss, lady, lazy, loose, love, lover, mistress, maid, mama, mother, Madonna, mouth, mink, narcotic, nurse, nutcase, oyster, oh baby, pearl, prick tease, plump, pinup, prostitute, prize, pushy, queen, quest, royal pain in the ass, rape bait, raw, romp, sexy shirt, shag, screw, smooch, smoke in. Spank, sport, sugar, sweetheart. Tits, tart, tease, temptation, trifle, tail, thing, ugly, vagina. Valentine, virgin, vow, vixen. Oh, war, whore, woozy, woman, womb, wet, wild thing. X is an X-rated, X-ray, my fucking X, U, zero. And in terms of naming, this poem is called Becoming Marilyn. Marilyn, Marilyn, her lips almost kiss, tongue slides behind front teeth, mouth of running water, a baptism, Marilyn. In the mirror, Norma Jean arches Marilyn's brow. From then on, whenever she thrusts a hip, she will hear someone call Marilyn, traffic slowing. And when she turns to wave, gloved hand tipped at the wrist, her smile will press her cheekbones into stones. So throughout this book, there's um, a poem that's been scattered. It's called Insomnia Diary. And I'll read one of those little bits. 1.46 AM. My ambience in a pillbox purchased from the gift shop at Frito Kahlo's Blue Home. Free to lay in that bed with Diego, pinned butterflies brushing overhead. I breathe quietly as a ghost. When the outside world murmurs, my heart revs its little engine, addicted to adrenaline. If I slow my breathing, will it slow, tamping the brakes as it corners? So um, one of the things that I learned, there were many things that I discovered when I started researching Marilyn Monroe. Um, 
and I did it because I wanted to try something new and write in persona. And I was undertaking my MFA. And so this was the thesis. Um, and one of the things I discovered, we had a lot in common, um, but what we had in common was insomnia. And, um, and with it came for Marilyn an addiction to barbiturates, which then led to her overdose. And for me, it's been um, Ambien, which from time to time I've found I've gotten addicted to. So that makes, that's a theme throughout this book. The next poem I'm gonna read is called Work. When opportunity failed to arrive like a taxi, I left home ahead of steam, took to haunting the clouded rooms, English leather, dark oak, cigar smoke. On stiletto heels, we could see the cards men held, the deck long ago stacked in the dealer's favor. Skirting around the boardroom, we forgot our places. Elbow to seat, the table already set against us. But I bury my lead as women often do and fashion a story. Charm becomes armor. We were armed, they were disarmed. Our lilting voices disturbing the papers piled on their desks, shuffling their order into mine. I think that was another thing that um, it surprised me was that Marilyn Monroe had um, started her own production company. She was the first actress to do so, broke with the studio um, and really worked, worked her career quite hard. Um, and I'm going to end with a poem that really addresses that. And you may have seen, there's a very famous photo of Marilyn and she is sitting, um, it's on a playground, I think outside of New York, and she's reading a copy of Ulysses, and it was taken by Eve Arnold. Um, so this poem is, um, it's got a bit of Joyce in it, so you will hear a bit of James Joyce and a bit of Ulysses, and you'll hear a bit of Marilyn and a bit of me. Reading Ulysses from an Eve Arnold photograph. Scholars call it parallax, me reading Joyce. I say parallegs to that, mine and Molly's, our skirts blowing up, showing cream muslin drawers. I wear white cotton panties, two pair doubled up for the scene that incited Joe to treat me like dirt. Yes, that's what I was reading when everyone assumed I was reading only the dirty parts. So that's what they wore, what, so that's what they wrote in the paper about me reading my first edition that I brought at the Strand and carried everywhere. So while the photographer was fiddling with the film, I pulled it out to read. And when she asked me if I liked it, I said, it's a slog, which everyone knows it is, but it's a bigger slog to be always in the kitchen to get his lordship breakfast. And it's a huge slog to break with the studio, move across country and start your own production company. Now that's a slog. So when I slog through Ulysses, it's because I might just option it, hire a writer, any director I want, and play the role of Molly. I don't care what anybody says. It'd be much better for the world to be governed by the women in it. You wouldn't see women going and killing one another, slaughtering. When do you ever see women rolling around drunk like they do? or gambling every penny they have and losing it on horses. Yes, because a woman, whatever she does, she knows where to stop and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, what a privilege. Thank you so much, Heidi, that was wonderful. And um, I know one of Heidi's poems is going to be in the new anthology that Susanna H. Case and Margot Taft Stever um, have edited and will be coming out in the spring of 2022. So in addition to Heidi's new book, um, please look for that when it comes out, Milk and Cake Press. Um, and Sophia will put some information in the chat about all of that. So thank you so much, Heidi. Um, we loved hearing your work and thank you for joining us from your vacation. We really appreciate you taking the time. So now we're going to hear from Jennifer Jean. 
Her poetry collections include Object Lesson from Lily Books and The Fool from Big Table. She also released the teaching resource book, Object Lesson, a guide to writing poetry from Lily Books and is a co-editor and co-translator for an anthology and development titled Her Story Is Contemporary Poetry by Arab Women. She has been awarded a Peter Taylor Fellowship from the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop, an Ambassador for Peace Award from the Women's Federation for World Peace. Her poetry, prose, and co-translations have appeared in many journals, including Wax Wing, Crab Creek Review, DMQ Review, On the Seawall, Salamander, The Common, and many more. She was the translations editor at Talking Writing Magazine and an organizer for the Her Story Is Collective and the founder of Free to Write Poetry Workshops for Trauma Survivors. She is the new program manager of 24, 24 Pearl Street of the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. She lives in Massachusetts with her husband and children, and she teaches sometimes for the Hudson Valley Writers Center. So please, everyone, help me welcome Jennifer Jean. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me. And thank you, Heidi and Barbara. Your readings were awesome and so inspiring. And I'm happy to be part of the group with you. Uh, I also want to say thank you to all the audience members. Um, as, as uh, my fellow reader said, it's difficult to come out on a summer day, you know, in the, at the end of summer. But also, uh, I know for my part, I'm going to be reading from my latest book, which contains a lot of tough material. It's called Object Lesson, as Jennifer said. Here's a copy of it here. And it, it explores uh, the issues surrounding human trafficking, especially sex trafficking here in America, as well as issues of objectification. And I know that that's tough stuff to listen to. It was tough to write about, definitely. And as you can imagine, tough to experience for, for the women that I uh, am talking about. Um, so just a real super quick background about how the book came about. I was uh, at a service, at a, at a church service, and the pastor, uh, a woman, she was talking about her experience with human trafficking, that she had seen something happen in Las Vegas and just something about her, her testimony just really struck me. I started crying and she said at the end of, uh, of her sermon, she said, if there's anyone out there that feels that they can do anything about this. And I just felt like, I'm just a poet. What can I do? I can't do anything, but I'm gonna try to do something. So I just took on that project and I started to uh, started to write. And a lot of it, it brought up a lot from my own history. Um, I am not a human trafficking survivor, but a lot in my life has uh, come very close to my making decisions that could have led in that direction. Uh, and as well, same for my mom, as it turns out. And so this first poem kind of goes into that a little bit of the history aspect of what kind of touched me to bring me to write about this topic. It starts with an epigraph by Amanda Hess, who's writing in Slate. And the epigraph is, Columbia senior Emma Sokowitz has been hauling her own dorm mattress around campus every day because the student she says raped her is still free to attend the school without formal consequences. And uh, folks in support of Emma created a hashtag uh, that went viral quite a bit a few years ago. It's, and it's the title of this poem, hashtag carry that weight. My mom was broken by five or six guys when dawn before I was born. That's gotta be the weight of the king. And she carries that, carried that, right past the police station on Burbank around noon. I consider carrying our queen size around our apartment, like those students for Emma from around the globe, but I'm just a weaker upper body. I take on my daughter's futon. My mom got it for her at Ikea. It's a lightweight and the idea is to lug it for about an hour at home, right as I go, some kind of science, some kind of art in order to relate. My daughter moves stuffed dogs and pigs off her quilt, helps me slide the pony colored twin onto my spine. She makes me a tortoise. She takes pictures, smile, smile, smile. I don't 
think I can bear it a minute. It's hers, my daughters, my mothers, all the grand hers. And I won't where I teach. I teach, so I'd mold hauling it to the university. But taking on a big thing like that, sweating, bending under that, you know what lives under a bed. All the weight of my frame thumps the ground in the kitchen as I dump the thing hard. My daughter rolls on it, giggles. My pen's gone, and my mom was broken by five or six guys one dawn before I was born. All right, so one of the things I did to write this collection wasn't just research, wasn't just dredging up my own history. I decided to, uh, to give back to the community, the survivors that I was writing about. So I volunteered to teach poetry workshops at uh, the local safe house uh, that I located through just a uh, network of friends. And so that's what this poem kind of gets into. When I taught poetry at the safe house, a kitten was lifted by the scruff, by one of the safe women. She stroked and stroked and it whirred. And we read Bitch by Caroline Kaiser. And later I thought about how that stroking woman once stirred from an occupational blackout and found a poem in her scrawl. She'd pressed its soul into memory, then burnt its remains in a Chinese bowl. The smoke whirled from thieves. She spoke the whole in class today to me and to the other sex trafficking survivors. She looked up and to the left, her tongue out at the corner like a schoolgirl, like a lioness, and I liked it. Okay, so I think this is the last poem I'm going to read from this collection. It's quite a long poem, and it's based on a series of interviews that I conducted with a survivor advocates. So that would be some uh, um, a young woman. Her name is Jasmine Marino. She actually uh, wrote the intro for the book. Um, and she's a survivor advocate, which means that she was, a, you know, she was trafficked and she came out of that life and now she advocates for survivors. And she's an amazing, amazing person. You should look her up. She runs Route One Ministries. Um, she does so many amazing things. And so this is, in, this is a persona poem in her voice and I, I had permission to write this. And it's also an epistolary. It's in the form of Jasmine talking to her past self because that's something we talked about. What would you tell your past self? Dear Jazz, when you're just a little chick at the bar and this regular dude from Roxbury jerks a jeweled hand out his pocket to flash his thick wad, don't think you can play him. He knows you. And later, when you're down your first day hooking, down 14 hours in a windowless salon in Connecticut, when you're in his jag to Cambridge, holding a new limp wad in your hand, see how small it is. Remember, this isn't your money. Think about how money burns. And when he parks and gets out and you get out and you two meet near the trunk of the jag in the dark of the morning, he'll hold open his jeweled hand and ask, is this gonna be a problem? Tell him, hell yeah, and walk away. But when you beat your truth bloody, when you pass the cash and tell him, no, it won't. Try to mean, no, it won't, because what I did for one or a thousand days cannot ruin me and mean it. Then walk away. But don't go to Revere. He knows where you live. And when you don't walk away, don't break your rules back in that hole in Connecticut. When you do break those rules, like when you let that bald dude choke you, understand there's no one home to lock up. You're not there anymore to say no to this shit or that piss. Your soul is gone and safe and sleeping and you will surely die if it's really you shutting the door to the moldy blue room no girl wants in that salon in Connecticut. But when it's shut, it's shut, it's shutting you in with the father of a daughter, with some mother's son. Let yourself think that, think this guy has kids. Even as you swallow up chuck acid, swallow their wad, this thought keeps them human. And if they're human like you, then you might forgive them someday. And later, when you're out of the life and your soul returns, let it hurt to be home. Don't use. When you stop using, know it's a sign that you've never heard of the word sober. 
And later, when you've got your own place and a kid and a job that needs a pantsuit and you're thinking about forgiveness a little and you're at, in that Saugus church basement with these women warriors and some weak coffee, you're with Barb who brings Christmas baskets to strippers on Route 1 and you lift your mug for a sip and hear this clear lyric, this swing low, sweet cherry eye. Don't ignore it. Some long gone former slaves are singing about the brightest day. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna transition to uh, reading another kind of poem. It's from a series that I've been working on, an eco poem series. Uh, I believe Barbara said it that right now we really need to address climate change. And I think through poetry, it's an excellent way to, to do this. So I've been writing a series of poems called The Pacific Poems. And um, this one is, uh, actually, I, almost, I, I never read it, but I just felt, I felt called to read it, maybe because fire season is approaching in California and a lot of the poems are, um, are set in California. And this poem, you can read it in, uh, at uh, On the Seawall. That's the, the online journal. It, it has a title that I might change, but the title is actually of a Bob Seeger album. If you've ever seen the Bob Seeger album Against the Wind uh, and the horses are running in the beach. So that's, that's what I had in my mind when I was uh, writing this. And it's called Against the Wind. All horses and homeless folk go to the beach when fires rip through California canyons. They run through surf against the wind, away from the flame of the night. When the choke smoke dies, they canter home to campfire stones, tent poles, push carts, hoof brush wire, salt block racks and spoons, the flats of certain spatulas. Not everything unnatural is gone. In the fortified Getty Museum, St. Martin dividing his cloak with a beggar, the piebald horse, and Van Gogh's irises are safe too. Sometimes I feel less than a work of art, like a horse awash in a wave, not a blaze, like I'm home free when the ash is thick on ground I've slept on for months. Sometimes I wait for miles of asters, blue dicks and desert pin cushions for an after fire super bloom to feel useful, created, though, I know that's as unwise as a California breeze after a decade of drought. Okay, and I just have one more poem, if that's, if that's all right, if I still have time. Okay, great. I wanted to make sure that I read one of my co-translations uh, just to, so it gives me an opportunity to, to mention or to re-mention uh, Her Story Is. It's a collective that I'm uh, part of, all women artists. Uh, we're, um, comprised of women artists from America and Iraq and, and also uh, other, from other Arab nations um, around the world. And we collaborate, co-translate each other's work, meet up, we've, we've had some meetups, it's fabulous. And it really speaks to the power of arts, but also the power of forgiveness, which is something that really hit home with that object lesson series, <laughs> how important forgiveness is. So same with this. So I'm going to read, um, this one poem that I co-translated with Amr al-Azraqi, it's published in Poetry Magazine, so you can look at it there. And it was written by Zakia El Marmouk, who's from Morocco. And it's called, I Sleep in My Inkwell and Wave to the Distance. To those who enter the fire with boats, who touch heaven with kites, who stuff roof holes with clouds, who hide under beds whenever the road stutters in the throat of footfalls entering fog, of footfalls that never return from the checkpoint, which only sends back bodies. To those who resort to the inkwell when speech narrows, who plant nails in their blood, whenever the wall slouches, more and more nails, so the lover's image does not fade into the traffic of silence. To those who collect their own ashes whenever their pillow is dry, whenever there's absence, who aren't tired of waving to loves in the distance, whenever maps are locked, to those who venture into meadows before the waters flow, who keep the keys whenever they know the doors were stolen, who leave their crutch on the threshold of the unknown, 
whenever life leaves them behind, to those who know themselves through the, their wounds, whenever the war sleeps in their eyes, while reassuring the subjects of war. To all those I say, the forest begins with a tree, let your left hand, which keeps the throne, shake your right hand. Maybe dreams hatch between them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I hope we get a chance to talk about um, the translations in the Q&A and, um, and the collective as well. So um, we'll, we'll have a chance to have people ask you about those, um, those projects that you're working on. You have a lot on your plate. Um, we'll start with a question that um, very often we have asked our other readers. We have a lot of students in the audience, many of whom are working on their first poetry collections. So um, we would love to hear your particular advice to the students. And at the center, I should mention that many of our students um, have already had a full, a full life, a full career, have raised children, uh, much like what Heidi was talking about in her recent interview that many of you might have read with Diane Seuss um, about how she stopped poetry for about 40 years after um, really starting it early and having a lot of success, winning a contest, getting invited to um, an MFA class with graduate students, PhD students, and then 40 years went by and she had a whole other life and raised her children um, and then went back to poetry as if she, you know, almost had never left it. Um, so we have a lot of those students at the center. That's, those are our primary students. They, they're retired and they've wanted to be writers for, for most of their lives and they've had to put it off for, for other reasons. So keeping in mind that their time may be a little bit more limited <laughs> than the students who are typically in MFA programs, um, advice that you have for the students about putting together a first collection. Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump in. Thank you for um, highlighting some of my story, and and I'm just going to say, you're you're never too old, <laughs> never too old. I mean, I'm proof of that. And um, and yeah, I mean, because because there's a a, a short span in front. Um, I I felt the need to move quickly and to to get at it instead of spending a lot of time, is this the right thing? I just go. And so I encourage to go and, and, it's, and it's fun, right? This is a learning journey that we're all on in different phases. And having come to it late in life, it's the most fun I can imagine having. Um, and, it's, and it's daunting to feel like you're playing catch up, but it's it's also just to go right at it. And in terms of putting together um, the first collection, I think that the best thing for me has been to, to be in school and take classes. I took classes from the get-go at the Hugo House in Seattle. And then I've gone to a couple of writing retreats here and there, and they've been so, so helpful. And then I went and at age 60, went back to school and got my master's um, through the low res program at NYU, which was terrific. Um, so I encourage reaching out, going to Hudson Valley and taking classes. I will be taking classes at Hudson Valley this fall. There's so, there's so much to, to learn from and so many wonderful people to learn from. And, and then just don't hesitate, go for it. Yeah, um, so I want to say something to that too. Um, I feel like uh, right now is an, is an amazing time to be an artist in general, but especially a poet, because you can really uh, DIY, is that do it yourself? You can, you can just, you know, pull from as many classes as you can, uh, take, take as many according to your own schedule. You can really put something together and um, what I've noticed, um, I have an MFA, but what I've noticed is that folks that do it that way are more risky, like risk-taking in the, in the good way that artists 
need to be, you know, and, and that's important because there are all kinds of important topics to address in the world. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, sometimes it's hard to get at how to do that. So having that sort of risk takingness is a plus. <laughs> so, so look at it as an advantage, I, I'd say. And then as for putting together a collection, I think, um, I think it's good to just, and this is the sort of risk taking thing, just put it together, you know, just do it, like let yourself mess up a little bit, you know, or, or seem to fail. It's not a failure. Actually, the more tries, the more things that you try, you know, you're on your way to success. Just do it as many times as you can until you get it. So I, I know I do that. I have a gajillion versions of my, of my manuscript, but I don't see that as a failure. And then I show as many people as I can, like whether it's friends or in uh, some kind of structured environment, class or workshop that's out there. Um, and just keep keep going with it and learning and learning and learning. Um, and, and see yourself at, a, at an advantage is really the thing. And let yourself taste risks and let yourself fail. I just, I, I wanna jump in and just say one thing, love, the process, love the writing, let it inhabit you and let your passion inhabit the page and to echo Heidi, go for it. But I think that, you know, to put too much of a, too much importance on the goal of publishing or reaching some imaginary, some imaginary star that is going to um, light up your life. I think um, it's it's better, in my opinion, to keep keep trying and never never stop trying. Send your work out, do everything you can to learn and stretch and be out there and involved in communities and in community writing centers. So um, I support everything that the others said. And I also just want to remind you, love the process. Love that. That's great advice from all of you. Yeah, that wonderful answers. Um, Sophia, do you have a question? Yes, we got a question in the chat, a great question from Lynn McGee. Lynn loved Heidi's poem, Hey, and was grateful to hear Heidi read it. That said, she noticed that she would never want to hear a man read it, which opens up a question about voice for Heidi as well as Barbara and Jennifer. Who do you want to read your work aloud and why? And how do you think about that question in general? I'll just address that um, sort of that particular poem. That was the very first time I've ever read that poem out loud. And um, and I've sort of skipped over it in, in the readings. And, but today I thought I'm here with these, as Jennifer said, these fierce feminist writers. And so I'm going to go for it. And, um, and it's hard. I mean, it's hard to hear those words because those are words that we do hear and we don't want to hear and um even to hear in my own voice i think it was it was a bit rugged um could a man read that poem well yeah absolutely but that would have a very different response for the listeners and so i think that's that's something to to think about um i don't have i don't have an answer but i it would be it would be interesting. I, I remember um, there was a reading. It was actually a, a theater production of poems, and a few of my poems were featured in it. And it was an actor. And there was one poem that I thought was had to be. It was had to had to be in in a very feminine voice. And to hear it read by this guy was really interesting. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I guess I'd be open to that, but it would be a very different experience. I guess to add to um, what Heidi said, I think 
once a poet is finished with a poem and publishes it and gives it out to the world, then it really doesn't belong to the poet anymore. And I think the experience of having your work shared by uh, any number of people and, and you know, a, a world of people is a goodness. And, you know, what we write for is to have our words resonate, at least in part. I mean, there are many reasons we write, but I think that granting um, an open heart to others who want to participate in your work is a good place to begin. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. It's your work is out there and it's it becomes its own thing. It's, it's alive on its own. Um, I know I thought a lot about that actually. I thought more about not who's gonna read it aloud. That's interesting, but more about um, men reading uh, my collection because it can be kind of accusatory or feel like it is. I don't think that it is. And I've asked people, I checked, <laughs> you know, um, but it could feel like that and I get that. And, and so, yeah, I just feel like my hope is that uh, I would have many men readers for that book. That's just my hope. I think it would be good. Um, but if, if not, that's, that's understandable actually, because it's, it's confronting. Just speaking about that one book, it's, it's very confronting. I think for, for a lot of us, not just men, but especially, especially men, I've just found that. So yeah. <laughs> In workshop, we often talk about um, the idea of persona poems and um, the fact that it's a little bit more complicated right now to, to feel um, there's a lot more examination writing persona poems. And I thought it was very interesting, Jennifer, when you read your persona poem um, in the voice of jazz, um, you told us uh, before you read it that you had permission from her. Um, yeah. And I think that you probably felt that was important for the audience to know that when reading um, and hearing the poem, um, especially for those who've read it maybe or listened to it for the first time tonight. So I'm wondering what all of you think about writing in, in persona and the complexities and contradictions that are implicit in, in that right now? Um, well, just as I just want to address that because the, the question arose a little bit uh, from, my, from my poem. It was a little bit of a spark uh, for the question. I've, I thought about that quite a bit, especially as I said, I'm not a survivor of sex trafficking. So there are other poems in there that are in the voice of not folks I, I interviewed um, but folks that I uh, read about. So they gave interviews to other folks, you know, to journalists or something like that. And so, you know, I had to create a guideline for myself. Um, you know, when would I do that? When would I, for this specific issue, write a persona poem? And for me, it was if they've given some kind of um, permission of some kind for their story to be out there. That kind of thing. And as long as I say, and it's in the book, like in the notes section, and if I say it, you know, I just created that because I think persona poems are important. Um, that's just where I stand right now. I think that we can, we can navigate this as writers, this, this, uh, this field and the, these questions. We just have to give it thought and, and have a, an open heart about it. I just, as a writer, I find that they're important. Um, to, 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 as part of our growth, but also to, to read them. Like how is so-and-so interpreting this experience? I think it's very human to do that, to try to, uh, to, to create empathy, to, to, as part of the process of creating empathy, the writing process can do that. Um, yeah, I think right now I'm, I think it's important to keep writing persona poems. I, I absolutely agree with everything that Jennifer said. And I think it, her book 
sounds amazing and the poems she read were brave and important and essential and we have to be willing to bear witness to the kinds of experiences that cross our paths and in the way that Jennifer described having what was obviously somewhat of an epiphany that she was called to make this work, um, to realize this work. So I think it's a question of being genuine and being um, respectful and also to witness the possibilities of sharing other voices that might be voiceless without the help of a poet who could channel that particular information. Yeah. So having written a book that is not entirely in persona, but largely in persona, um, I approach that idea of writing in, particularly in, in the persona of Marilyn Monroe, a very, very famous person, um, because I was interested in this performance culture that we're all living in and how we are um, all in some way, particularly with social media, but we are performing some version of ourselves. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm, and then I was, have also been interested in sort of the celebrity worship culture that we have. And as I was kicking around these larger ideas, um, I came to, to, to Marilyn who nearly 60 years after her death has remained the most famous woman in the world and why is that? And, um, and could I give voice to, to, to her? And so I went through this deep process of research in order to inhabit her in a way that I felt was true. Um, and yet along the way, you realize she's, Marilyn is a performance of Norma Jean, who's a, you know, we're, we're all performing. And, and so, so part of what happened in the writing and that happens in my collection is that sort of layered sense of performance where we, we, we see these various different women. Um, there's essentially two voices, right? But they're, but they're, they're versions of each other and we're versions of ourselves. And there's a blending that takes place um, between the speaker and Marilyn in times where you can't tell who's, who's speaking. And that to me was really important um, to have that, that sense because I wanted, I wanted that idea of, of of we are all performing and to, to sort of shine a light on that and, and on that um, and on the mask that we are putting on, um, as T.S. Eliot says, to go out in the street every day. So um, it's, I think it's, I think it's, I, I, for me, it was an amazing challenge. Um, and I encourage um, poets who haven't done it to, to do it. And I know many of, many of the people here have. Thank you so much for those answers. Another craft question we have for the three of you is a general question about what your regular writing process is like, even before you start necessarily working on a book. Just what the rules and structures that you give yourself are as a general practice for poetry writing are, are like. I'm just going to be really quick and say, I have no rules and my only rule is break all the rules. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's great. So it was, the question was, what is the, our process of writing? Like how we- What is your regular out? practice? How do you keep yourself writing? If you have rules, um, unlike Barbara, what are they? <laughs> well, I, for me, I know that um, it, it all, revolved around like whatever my schedule is in my rest of my life. And for a long time I was an adjunct. And so I had a crazy schedule, but I, and I didn't like it, but I was, but I knew it and I have kids, young kids. 
well, no, one of them's 18, actually. <laughs> He's a man. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I had something worked out and I was pretty confident. In fact, in fact, I think I was a little cocky. Like I, I know how to write in this busy schedule that I have. And then I got a different job. And now I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know when to write. I'm confused actually. <laughs> I have been writing, but um, it's, it's off. So, so I, just, I just know that for me, I realized I had to analyze myself again, like I did, must have done like years ago when I started the adjuncting and just figured out like what's going to work with my schedule. Like when can I have that, that private time to write and that time to deep dive, which for me includes having a stack of poetry books. Like I like to, I like to read from back to front in this, in, when I'm writing, like, because I don't want to get into their like I like to read for pleasure. So when I'm reading for pleasure, I'll read from front to back of poetry book, but back to front when I'm in my writing space, just so I can just absorb, absorb, listen to music, like get into the space and then I, I can write. And so that's what I'm looking for time to do. And as I said, with a new job, it's been weird and not, not happened, but I know I'm gonna get my groove very soon. I'm determined, I'm manifesting this, <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> Well, I'm with Barbara. I have no rules. Um, it's, I'm just absolutely delighted whenever I get to the page and surprised when I get there and surprised at what happens there. And, um, and if I don't get to the page, I don't beat myself up and, you know, days, weeks, months can go by and I'm, you know, that's, even though time is ticking here. <laughs> the seaborne clock um but it doesn't matter because you know when, when you get there is in what you do and where you go with that is is everything right i think i misunderstood the question but um <laughs> i, well, you I had really great <laughs> answer <laughs> we liked your answer well in any case um you know i think having a practice if you can manage it will keep the words flowing so i i would advise that i think a, a practice that keeps you fluid and um something i remember kim stafford writing in a book that he and i collaborated on was about um the wood of a violin and apparently if a violin is left unplayed for a long time, the wood becomes more brittle and the music becomes less sonorous. So I think the lesson or the takeaway is that the practice keeps the instrument tuned. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. We just heard from Jennifer that she got cut off, but she's on her husband's account. So she is here. I see her. <laughs> so we're going to pin you now. She's back. Yay. Whoops. Whoops. Okay. We're going to ask you to unmute. <laughs> we're going to pin the others too. Okay, there, there's Bar and here comes Heidi back. Perfect. Ask to unmute and then make Sebastian Jean a co host. There we go. Hi. <laughs> All is well. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. I'd love to ask um, the three of you what you're working on right now. Um, I know Jennifer needs to get into her groove again um, for her new project, but um, if there's anything that you'd like to talk about um, that you're you're working on right now, and it doesn't have to be a book of poetry, it could be translations, anything that, that you're doing creatively right now that you'd like to share. I can I can speak about it. So I'm I finished uh, the eco poem series, The Pacific. So that's just I'm sending that out. And now I'm just slowly another 
you know, collection is kind of crystallizing in my mind. Um, something around voices, something about voices, I don't know, that's kind of crystallizing, but more solidly, um, I think it was in my bio, I'm working on an anthology of co-translations uh, uh, from the Arabic with the her story is women um, and on the American side with a poet some of you might know of, uh, Kiran Kapoor. She's uh, also a Boston area poet. So we work very closely with uh, about five different women co-translators and the anthology is taking shape. We're hoping that, you know, we're talking to presses, <laughs> hoping that that's gonna come out um, sooner rather than later. It's fun, it's like frustrating, but it's, it's really great, great project. I think it's too soon for me to talk about the things that I have rumbling around, but there are lots of different kinds of ideas that seem to be um, in, <laughs> either in, in contest with each other, and I am not sure which one is going to take precedence, but I'm just writing and having um, a time that's, I guess I would say, a time of exploration. Looking forward, looking, I'm looking forward to reading all of that, whatever, whatever, whatever ends up coming out of that, Barbara and Jennifer. Um, I found myself writing longer poems and they, they're taking mostly two forms. Um, Recently, they're either long epistolary poems um, or um, or zui hitsus. Um, so kind kind of like a little bit lyric essay, a little poem, a little God knows what. But um, they that and many of them are circling around um, eco themes um, and concerned about the environment living here in the West, um, it's a constant concern. And I mean, it's a constant concern for all of us, but um, it's, it's something we're on guard all the time. Um, and then I, and then it's, I don't know where this is going to go, but I've started, um, I've started a memoir about my 20s in Silicon Valley, which was, um, Sort of when Silicon Valley was happening, it was the beginning of the personal computing revolution, and I was involved in all of it, um, and and kind of living a crazy life as well. So, who knows where that will go? Um, very two different, very work streams, um, and very entertaining to to explore and see what happens. Thank you for asking. Sophia, do you have another question or would you like me to, to ask a follow-up question to them? Maybe you can ask a follow-up question and I'll ask the next one. Okay, great, because we have time, I think, for, for two more. Um, so in terms of um, activism and writing, I, it's, it's very interesting to me um, the fact that all of your poems tonight, the three of you, they all really talked about some kind of poetry as activism, climate change, um, you know, women's rights. Could you talk a little bit more about your stance as the poet, as activist, as you yourself see it? I'll say something that um, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I wish that I could be more political in my life. And I feel in some ways that my experience of um, my career was working as a book publisher for 40 years. And so working 50, 60 hour weeks, 50 weeks a year was pretty intense. I'm not, 
I don't think there's any excuse for not being more active if you can be and doing, you know, just doing more. I think people should always do more, but I feel a little bit apologetic that I haven't done more yet in the work that I did as a publisher, I was always aware of, I, I did a lot of work. Um, I published a lot of work about the environment. That was one of the main areas that I focused on as an editor and as a publisher and also work in translation. So I feel that, well, I don't feel, I should say, I hope that some of that work has contributed to the good of to the good of the um, cause to the causes and that I have done something that is positive and isn't taking away from um, isn't taking away from the world as um, as we know it. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess I'm saying I'm glad I wasn't a banker and that I am um, glad that this last book is probably more political than any of the others I've written. And I think that I will continue to write more political work because it seems to be what is calling to me. Um, I, I'm so glad you're not a banker. <laughs> I think the world is very glad you're not a banker. Thank you. Um, I actually thought a lot about this, this question about being an activist. Um, because I, I told everyone the story of how I came to write about uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking. So it wasn't that I, I don't feel like I wanted to do it. It was, someone said it, I was called to, I think Barbara, you said, call, I was called to do it. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. And, um, and it just, and I was always watching myself, like, am I still into this? And then I was, so I just kept, the fire was still burning. So I kept going with it. Um, and uh, yeah, same thing with the, with, the, with the climate stuff. I actually, do this uh, judging for the bow seat ocean awareness. It's like this program for high school and middle school uh, poets to write about uh, the ocean, you know. And I was uh, I was you know called to to do um, to do uh, judging for them. And they, you know, I kept reading these poems by high schoolers about the environment. And it just made me think about where I grew up by the Pacific Ocean in Los Angeles. And I just you know, because we have to read hundreds of those poems. It's like a, just overwhelming, actually. And you have a very short time to do it. So I just was getting, it just sort of the fire was starting to get lit about that issue. And so I decided to, to just write, just I had something to say about that my upbringing in Pacific and was it, was the ocean clean and things like that, just like these kids did. And then I, um, yeah, I just had to ask myself, as more poems came out, I had to ask myself the same thing, like, you know, am I still, is this fire still happening? And for a while I thought, oh, maybe I'm an activist, but I actually decided, and I even put that like in some bios, but I decided I'm not, I think it just, a topic got to get a hold of me. And I do hope that it helps the world in some way. I don't know if it does, but I hope, I hope it does. Um, just like Barbara was saying, I, I think that that's maybe what you're getting at. I kind of, I hope it's doing something and to just, I think that's the best way to write about these issues. I think that's what I'm also, I'm trying to get at. It's a long way to get at saying, I don't think it's, I think sometimes we, people try to write a political poem and it just doesn't quite work. I think you gotta wait for the fire and see where you're best suited to, you know, according to the energy level of what you're putting into the work, where, where you're best suited to talk about certain things. Cause we all care about so many things. So which ones do we talk about? I think it's where the fire is. Yeah. I, I, I love that idea of where the fire is. Um, I write what I know. Um, and I've been a lifelong feminist and I write that and I've been a lifelong environmentalist and I write that. And um, as an editor at the Adroit Journal, um, I use the 
the place that I have in this world is a very privileged place. And so I, I use what I, that role as much as I can to make space for those who, who don't have the privilege that I've had. Um, but I would never consider myself an activist. One of my kids is, that's a good thing. Those were such amazing answers. Thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer keeps mentioning the fire, finding where the fire is. So what is it about poetry that's on fire with the three of you? Um, which is another way of asking, why is poetry the medium that you keep coming back to? Uh, well, um, reading and language uh, really saved me when I was younger. I think that's a lot of writers. Uh, but just I know for myself, it's I grew up in a very dangerous area, poor, and I was I was protected by a book, you know, or I was hoping I was. I would carry around a book wherever I went. I would read, and so just language entered my life like quite early and in an important way, and so it's just the way I express myself, um, and I find it fun. I Barbara mentioned earlier, like love the process. I think that uh, for the book thing, but also for poetry, like. Just, I love to just get into that space of trying to figure out, solve a problem, or if I, some poems I'm maybe, maybe making an argument, so to speak, about something like trying to say something, trying to get something out. It's just fun to like get to do the, go through the process and feel the satisfaction of getting closer, even if sometimes I don't always hit it. <laughs> but just, um, yeah, it's, it comes from something important. So, and it's still burning and I think the same thing would go for poetry in general for me. Like if I thought, yeah, this isn't this isn't burning so much, you know, maybe my energies are best somewhere else. But it has, I don't see that happening. It hasn't happened yet. It probably won't. I think the idea of expressing poetry and um, the urgency of writing poetry as a flame is a wonderful idea. And it's something that is true for all the arts. And I think that art in any form elevates us. And I think what, what all poets strive for is to have the feeling of being elevated through the writing that they do, and also to immerse themselves in the writing of others and become a part of either a part of a, a community or just part of a single poem just to feel that the fire of that poem or the music or the intellect or the the sacred or the profane and i think it's it's something that we we look to art for a feeling of elevation and that's another way of expressing the fire i think yeah. uh, fire is such a wonderful metaphor for poetry and you think about i was in, we just had the olympics right and the that the olympic torch being passed which i don't think they did this time but generally how it gets passed around the world and that is is a, a wonderful image as is the campfire that we gather around and and through the pandemic how people had gathered around outside around fires to keep warm and to keep community and i think poetry can play that role and has played that role particularly over these last long 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 months <laughs> and here we are and to Hudson Valley and Jennifer and everyone, thank you for creating um, the hearth that we've gathered around tonight. To push thank you so heart. much for being here. This was a wonderful event. Um, thank you for letting us record it. We will, um, of course, have it on our YouTube channel and um, please share it when you, when you get the link from Sophia. Um, if people you know would be interested in and hearing it and if you came late and um, didn't hear the beginning please make sure you go back and listen to it Sophia will send you the link when it's up and we will send you all the chat as well so you can see what 
um, your fans were saying about you uh, as you were reading, if you didn't get a chance to read everything tonight. Thank you all for coming. Please join us next week for Paisley Rickdell and Carol Ajarian as they read prose and save the date for the gala. Um, you will be able to reserve a ticket from wherever you are and see the, the film um, that we're going to create for you. We're honoring Melissa Phoebos, Garth Greenwell, and Alpha Michael Weaver. So that will be Friday, November 5th. We hope to see you all back here for that. Um, thank you all for being here.